While the release of The Man with the Golden Gun very nearly spilled doom for the James Bond franchise as a whole, 1977's The Spy Who Loved Me, which grossed $185 million worldwide, put the Bond franchise back on top and firmly established Roger Moore as the 007 of his era. Now, originally, the film was intended to be followed by For Your Eyes Only, which was originally teased at the end of Spy Who Loved Me. But the same summer that movie came out, a little film you may have heard of came out called Star Wars. All of a sudden, every studio in town was coming out with their own sci-fi epic, movies that included Star Trek, The Motion Picture, The Black Hole, Alien, and of course, Battlestar Galactica, which was actually a TV pilot that they released as a movie. In order to stay competitive, Albert R. Broccoli, who is now producing the series solo, decided he had to make his own sci-fi epic by launching everyone's favorite super spy into space, Moonraker. I know that a lot of James Bond fans have a big problem with this movie, but hear me out, it kinda works, but it wouldn't work with anybody except for Roger Moore as James Bond. I mean, look, I don't even really know where to begin with this one. Obviously, the success of Star Wars couldn't be ignored, but I don't really understand why Broccoli thought it was a good idea to bring Bond into space. The very idea would have probably had Ian Fleming turning in his grave, but Broccoli figured I'm sure that the space gimmick would bring in a few extra bucks, and he was right, because for a while, Moonraker was the highest grossing James Bond movie of all time. In fact, that record was held until Goldeneye came out in 1995. Back in 1979 though, sending James Bond into space was not an easy thing to do. In order to have cutting edge special effects and to hire a company like Industrial Light and Magic, ILM, that would have meant that the producers would have had to have given up a massive chunk of the gross. In fact, this very thing happened when Abu Dhabi Broccoli went to ILM for help. Thus, the Bond production crew really had to do all the special effects work in-house. This would prove to be a very costly venture, with the finished film coming in at $34 million, which was $20 million more than what the previous film cost, and that was a lavish James Bond outing, and three times what it cost to make Star Wars, even $4 million more than the first Star Trek film, which at its time was considered a very costly flop. In order to save money, the decision was made to move the shoot to France where the producers could catch a text break. They also raised some cash by loading the film with as much product placement as possible. At one point, James Bond is going down a mountain road on a gurney and he goes past three separate billboards selling three separate products before finally sending the henchmen he's fighting through a fourth. It's a pretty silly scene, and even Lewis Gilbert, who returned to direct this film after doing Spy Who Loved Me, said in the DVD commentary that it was all a little bit much. But with so much money being put into the space footage, the rest of the film unfortunately does feel a bit like an afterthought. The lavish look of The Spy Who Loved Me is gone. Rather, the first two thirds of this movie kind of looks a little cheap with its soft focus lensing, which is very much of the time. The look of the film is only really dazzling once they get into space, and I have to give it to them. The special effects for the time are actually quite good. Now, while they're on Earth, there are some good moments. There's a really good sword fight about halfway through the movie, and there's a great gondola chase, although it's ruined by the now infamous hashtag pigeon double take. Yes, it's a pigeon. He does a double take. So, as I said, the special effects for the era pretty good, and Derek Mettings, who was in charge of them, received an Academy Award nomination for his work, but of course they lost to Alien, and I have to say, you look at the special effects in Alien, and you can kind of understand why. As it stands, Moonraker, I would say, is probably the dumbest installment of the series, and it hasn't really aged well, but it's kind of a fun film in its own right. In fact, I watched this movie on 35mm some years ago at a midnight screening, pretty drunk, and we all had a blast watching the movie. I mean, was it dumb? Sure, it was dumb, but it was kind of fun. And I think that's really the way to watch this movie. If you watch it as a really silly James Bond movie, and there are very few that are sillier, it's a cut above the worst installments of the series. Play it again, son. It's fun in a I can't believe this was actually made kind of way. And I'm sure that one day they'll do it on how this get made, because if ever a James Bond movie called out for their attention, this is the one. 
Now, granted, the film is essentially a remake of The Spy Who Loved Me in Space, minus a lot of the excitement. So it looks like Lewis Gilbert and writer Christopher Wood and Richard Maybaum kind of recycled what they had going on the last one. But you know what? They had to focus on the special effects, so I get it. It has its good points, and I have to say, Roger Moore gives it its all. I give the script for this one a uh, pretty standard maybe 5 on 10, although Christopher Wood has some good dialogue, especially when it's coming out of Michelle Lonsdale's mouth, such as the great line, Look after Mr. Bond. See that some harm comes to him. As for James Bond himself, I think Roger Moore actually gives a great performance, and I don't think this movie would work with anybody but Roger Moore in the lead. You see, Roger Moore is kind of silly, raises an eyebrow, doesn't take it all too seriously. If Roger Moore was in this, he would seem like he was so embarrassed the movie would be almost unwatchable. Roger Moore, he takes it in stride. Yes, in space, it's really good. It's a testament to his likability in the role that he actually manages to make the idea of James Bond in a spacesuit suiting laser guns kind of work. Now, as far as the Bond villains go, there's a pretty good one in this one. Michelle Lonsdale, who is an actor who died recently and has been in tons of movies like Day of the Jackal, The Name of the Rose, is on board as Hugo Drax, who is basically a ripoff of the previous film's Carl Stromberg. Lonsdale's okay, but he does seem a little bit like the movies at arm's length. Like, he knows this is silly, he's accepting a paycheck, he's moving on. I like his look and I think he's a great actor, but mm, not sure he's the best villain that they've had. <laughs> Heartbroken, Mr. Drax. Take a giant step for mankind. Where's Drax? Oh, he had to fly. But of course, Richard Keel returns to the series as Jaws, but this time the character has been given much more screen time considering how popular he was in The Spy Who Loved Me, and he even kind of gets a love interest in the form of Dolly, a petite blonde with superhuman strength. An incredibly stupid move, Jaws, who was formerly a mass murderer, becomes a good guy towards the end of the film, and teams up with Bond and Goodhead to stop Drax. The reason for this is that children loved him so much they sent in letter after letter to Eon Productions, begging them to make Jaws a goodie. Mercifully, the character did not return in For Your Eyes Only. I give the villains a mixed bag, about a 6 on 10. As far as Bond girls go, Lois Shiles has the dubious honor of playing the Bond girl with the most leeringly inappropriate name in screen history, Dr. Holly Goodhead. Wink, 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 wink. I am looking for Dr. Goodhead. You just found her. I cannot believe this made it past the censors. It makes pussy galore look clean as a whistle. Sadly, Shiles is kind of bland in the part. She looks great, but doesn't deliver much to the film, and I find that her and Moore's chemistry, not great. I give the Bond girl about a six on 10. Bond music, however, now we're talking. John Barry is back and produces one of his best ever James Bond scores, and it's actually a much better score than the film deserves. It's like a classic space opera. He was doing this a lot though, back in the 70s. He did an Italian movie called Star Crash that's awful, but the soundtrack is great. And same thing for The Black Hole, which of course I do have a soft spot for, but has this amazing score by John Barry. I mean, he was just damn good at the time. I also kind of like the nice theme song by Shirley Bassey, although the disco remix of it at the end is a little, uh. Score gets a nine on 10. Body count in this one is 14. James Bond kills quite a few people in this movie. Number of women Bond sleeps with in this, however, he does three women in this outing, including the gorgeous Corrine Clary, who sadly pays the ultimate price for her night of passion with 007, meaning, of course, that she gets devoured by a pack of hungry Doberman pictures. Ouch. The gadgets in this one are pretty cool. The laser guns are nifty, and there's a really cool wristwatch that Bond goes that shoots poison pellets and steel darts. That said, not much else in this movie besides that, although the whole film's kind of a gadget if you look at it, I mean, it's James Bond in space. There's also a couple nifty double entendres. In fact, the niftiest one comes from Q, because at the end of the movie you see M and Q and everybody, they catch Bond in the middle of doing some business in space, and then M goes, 007, what are you doing? And then Q says, I believe he's attempting re-entry, sir. Awesome. As I said, Moonraker is not my favorite Bond film, but I do have a soft spot for it, so I've got to give it a 6 on 10. A lot of people would give it much, much lower, but there's something about Moonraker that I just can't help but kind of enjoy. And, you know, Bond movies in some ways are a bit like sex. Even when it's bad, it's still pretty good. And audiences, I guess, agreed with me, with Moonraker a smash hit, pulling in $70 million in the US 
and a worldwide total of 211 million. So maybe it wasn't such a stupid idea to send Bond into space after all. Of course, he would come back down to Earth on his next outing, but that's a story for another day. Missed Mr. Bond. Did I?